Hi, my name is Emily. I'm from Defence Force Recruiting and we are live today from RAF Base East Sale just outside of Melbourne. RAF Base East Sale plays a major role in training Air Force personnel and is also home to the Aviation Candidate Management Centre, which is responsible for the HR management of officer aviation candidates through the attraction, selection and training process. If you have applied for an aviation role, such as pilot, air traffic controller or mission aircrew, you will attend East Sale as part of the aviation screening program. The ASP is part of the officer aviation selection process here. You will get first-hand experience of the training, recreational and accommodation facilities at RAF Base East Sale, as well as the opportunity to talk with trainees and instructors at the Air Academy. I'm here tonight with three Air Force personnel to answer your questions about the aviation screening program and aviation roles in the Air Force. We will be here for the next hour or so, so make sure you write in and get your questions answered. Now we'll start with traditional introductions. If you could please share with us your name, your job role and time spent in the Air Force to date. Hi, I'm Alana. I am Mission Air Crew and I joined the Air Force four years ago, as almost four years ago now, as Air Base Protection. Uh, then I went to reserves and now I'm back here in SAIL now doing mission air crew training to become a maritime patrol and response officer. Hi, I'm Daniel and I'm a pilot who's just currently finished number one flying training school and is about to move over to Pierce to attend number two flying training school in the advanced phase of our course. I joined a year and a half ago in January of 2018. Hi, I'm Teddy. Uh, I joined 20 years ago uh, as a pilot. Uh, I'm actually now an air traffic controller and currently an Air Force advocate for the aviation screening program. Fantastic. What made you choose to apply for your particular job role? I think uh, coming straight out of school into gap year, I had no idea what I, what I wanted to do. So it was a great way for me to, to get a taste of the Air Force and see what it was like. And as soon as I joined and heard about the job role of air combat officer, now known as mission air crew, uh, I knew that it was what I wanted to do straight away. Um, from a very young age, I knew that uh, being a pilot is something that I wanted to do. Looking back from Adelaide where the Clips 500 was on, I saw the fighter jets flying over there and I knew from then on that that was something that I could try and put my eyes to for the future. Yeah, I've got two parts to, to that answer. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to join as a pilot because I wanted to be a fighter pilot or an astronaut. <laughs> they didn't have astronauts, so I joined, uh, tried to join as a pilot and I was successful. Um, however, eventually uh, after some pilot training and some interim postings, I actually transitioned to air traffic control. Um, and I fell in love with that really just from being exposed to it, um, seeing the operations they do, going up in the tower, watching aircraft take off and land, controllers drinking lots of coffee. They, <laughs> they seem to have a really secure job earning lots of money and I went, hey, yep, uh, that looks like something I want to do. And so I applied for the training and got in. Yeah, fantastic. Now you can hear some noise behind us right now. Obviously we're live and we are at an airbase, so there is some aircraft uh, moving around just outside behind us. Um, now. Were you guys always set on a military career? Did you have family uh, involved? What made you choose military? I, d I don't have any family that are in the military. I had, as I said before, no idea what I wanted to do. Actually came across the gap year on Facebook as an ad on Facebook and thought that that's something that I would love to try. And it was a good, good way for me to just have the one year and see what it's like before signing up for a job for a lot longer than that. And yeah, I, I love that I'm doing it now, so. Cool. When I was looking at becoming a pilot, I was looking into whether to join the military or to join via the civilian street. And when further looking into joining the military, I saw that the lifestyle was something that I would have enjoyed and being paid to do what I wanted to do and being paid to train was a very big turning factor for me. Yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I didn't have any family or friends or any connections uh, to defence at all. When I was at school, I was being pushed into music or science or, or, or something like that. To, um, however, like I said, I just had this pipe dream of wanting to be a fighter pilot um, yeah and the only way to do that is to join the military but I I'm also admit that you know being paid mm. to train was a was a big factor as well when I was leaving school. Yeah wonderful so where do you see yourself uh, progressing or specializing within your career? Uh, just six weeks ago I got streamed as maritime so after my I finish my training here in a couple of weeks time I'll be progressing to Adelaide to convert to the P8 uh, Poseidon so there I'll be training on that, converting for six months and then going operational with that for the next three to four years. Uh, following on from that, I'll take wherever, 
wherever the job takes me, I'm excited for any opportunity that presents itself. Was Maritime your first preference? Maritime was. So as soon as I heard about the job of all the different roles, Maritime was the one that stood out to me immediately, mainly due to the, the crew environment and working with a team. That's awesome. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> How about yourself? I'm currently, currently striving to become a fighter pilot within the Royal Australian Air Force, but if I'm una unable to achieve that like Alana, I'd like to go and fly the P8 Poseidon okay. out of RAF Base Edinburgh as well. Yeah, nice. Yeah, I might, I might not go into the future, I'll go back <laughs> into the past. Uh, yeah, as, a, as an air traffic controller, um, I definitely had a preference for the, the tactical type roles that we have. So, you know, I applied to do lots of courses on um, the Battlefield Air Space Control course. Mm. Um, and that actually led me down a pathway of, of operating, rather than doing so much the domestic air traffic control, I had lots of opportunities to work with uh, Australian Army and Special Forces. Um, you know, that led me to an exchange posting with the United States Marine Corps for three years, um, living in San Diego, it was pretty great. Um, you know, and, and lots of deployments opportunities come out of uh, getting involved in the tactical elements of air traffic control. Great. Um, so we do have some questions coming in, so we'll jump straight to those. Now, Toby has asked, was the selection process difficult? Absolutely. So it's, it's not an easy process, but if you are proactive and go ahead and do all the paperwork that you have to do, once you actually get to the aviation screening program, the testing is difficult, but it is there to see the way that you work. And I think that if you go into it with a great mindset and just try to do the best that you can, then that's going to help you out. Yeah, for sure. I'd agree much with what Alana just said. Um, I wouldn't be upset if it was quite a lengthy process either. Um, as long as you keep striving, you keep persisting and asking questions and ringing up DFR and asking about how your application is going, they're always there to support you and actually get you through. Uh, yeah, it, when, when I joined 20 years ago, the, the process was a little bit different, but, but, but also quite difficult. That There are lots of steps that you need to get through. Um, but you know, my advice is if you're passionate a, a, about a career in defence and in aviation, you know, be persistent and, and keep going because that's one of the elements that we're looking for. Yeah, definitely. Uh, now, Johnny asks, do you have any advice to prepare for the max testing? So can we explain what that is and, and what's involved? <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I get asked this, as, as a, an advocate for the screening yeah. program, I get asked this question e every day. Um, my advice or my answer to that question is just apply and come and do the testing. Mm. Um, you actually get three chances at the testing and, and granted it might be intimidating that after the first, uh, the, the first opportunity, if you aren't progressed, you have to wait a whole 12 months to come back. Mm -hmm. But when, when you come back in that, uh, when you come for that first test, you're either going to get progressed, but if you don't, we're going to actually give you some feedback and tell you what your uh, weaknesses are and, and give you some, some, some advice and some, some tools that you can use to actually go away and improve on those weaknesses so that when you come back the, the second time, you might have uh, a better opportunity, a better chance. Um, you know, before you come for the first time, it's really hard to gauge what you should concentrate on or what you should practice. So my advice is just apply and come down and do the testing. Fantastic. And we should note, is the aviation screening program just for Air Force? Uh, well, no. So, it, I guess there's two parts, two answers to that question. First of all, um, it doesn't matter what job role you apply for within officer aviation. So whether it is pilot or mission air crew or mission controller, uh, from an Air Force perspective, uh, it doesn't matter. You will come to ASP, you will do all of the testing and we may or may not progress you for any of those job roles. It doesn't matter what you apply for. But in addition to that, um, we may, or, uh, we may be able to progress you for pilot uh, and aviation warfare, uh, warfare officer jobs in the Navy. Uh, and uh, if you're applying for ADFA, there are Army opportunities for, uh, for Army pilot as well. Wonderful. Uh, so Habe asked, being a pilot, are there any restrictions on your eyesight? So what if you wear glasses? That's something you need to look into when applying and um, through the medical process they'll discuss that. There are definitely pilots who wear glasses currently, but that's definitely something you need to look into with your medical. Wonderful. Noah asks, do you have to have good grades in school to do what you're doing? How do um, you guys go in school? <laughs> quite well, but just finishing year 12 is all that you need. So if you, if you are passionate and want to give it a shot, then it doesn't matter if you weren't the greatest at school, you can still come down and have a go at the testing and see, see how you go. 
Sure. Yeah, I definitely wasn't the smartest person in my class at school, but I just strived and continued to work hard, and that's all really you need to do, and mm -hmm. had the goal and set yourself out to get that. Yeah, you don't, absolutely. There's no, other than finishing year 12, there's no strict uh, requirements. Yeah, it helps if you're academic, um, but at the same time, my advice is just apply and come down, you know, and we will give you advice on, on what you might need to improve to progress. Can you apply for mission specialisations directly through recruiting? So you uh, apply for a mission role, however, when you come down and start the training, if you go and uh, if you stream the mission way, you'll go to Air Mission Training School, which is where I am, and you start on Mission Elementary course, which is a 12-week course. And from that course, you then can put your, you obviously put your preferences in. You put them in a few times throughout the course. And if your first preference is air traffic control, then they'll definitely take that into account. But you have all the opportunities of air traffic control, mission air crew or mission controller throughout Mission Elementary course. And you can change your mind as you go throughout. So whether you apply for one particular stream at the beginning and one particular job, you have the opportunity to change your mind along the way through mission and air mission training school. Now, Teddy, you're involved firsthand in shaping the careers of our future recruits in your role in the aviation screening program. So uh, let's hear a little bit more about your journey from when you first attended the school here yourself. Uh, so I joined the Air Force 20 years ago as a pilot. Uh, but quickly transitioned into the officer aviation stream of air traffic control. So I trained uh, and controlled here at RAF Base East Sale. I've also instructed at the School of Air Traffic Control, uh, but my current role is as the Air Force Advocate for the Aviation Screening Program here at the Aviation Candidate Management Centre. Uh, so my main role is to pre-brief candidates, then assess and compile results and, and debrief candidates on their performance before they leave East Sale. Aviation screening uh, programs happen on an as-required basis, but on average we run one every two weeks. Once candidates arrive, it's, it's a two-day course, uh, which includes two four-hour testing sessions, uh, but the rest of the time is not wasted. Uh, we actually use that time to introduce uh, candidates to the mission roles, the non-pilot roles that we have available, uh, because it may be that even though you've applied for pilot, if you aren't progressed for pilot, we may have other roles that are available to you. In the air traffic control environment, teamwork is essential uh, to ensure the safe and expeditious flight uh, of traffic in and out of an airport. Uh, you can't have one controller uh, controlling all of the aeroplanes that are taxiing on the ground, taking off and landing on the runway, and also flying as far as 50 nautical miles away from an aerodrome. Uh, it takes a team of people, uh, some of them using radars to control, some of them looking at a tower window and coordinating very closely with each other uh, to ensure the, the mission is completed. In the Air Force, uh, we train to the same standards as the civilian controllers and we receive the same license. In fact, if you fly into Darwin or Townsville or Newcastle Airport, you're actually being controlled by, by Air Force air traffic controllers. Uh, so there's no difference there. The key uh, difference to the civilian counterparts is that the opportunity to deploy overseas. Uh, and that could be in a standard domestic air traffic control role, uh, but it could also be in the battlefield airspace control role. I've had the opportunity to do lots of exciting uh, things throughout my career. Um, I've been posted all over the country uh, within Australia, uh, but probably the highlights of my career have been uh, my overseas exchange posting to the United States uh, with the US Marine Corps. Uh, that included a deployment to Afghanistan. Um, I've also, I was also deployed to Haiti after the earthquake in 2010 um, and I've had lots of other uh, opportunities that I never thought I would get uh, when joining as a pilot. For example, uh, being the simulator manager at the School of Air Traffic Control uh, during the implementation of a brand new simulator uh, around about 10 years ago. So it was great to hear about the experiences that a role in the Air Force has offered you, Teddy. You've obviously had quite a few, which is awesome, um, both regional and overseas as well. Now, you mentioned implementing the new simulator here. So can you tell us a little bit more about some of those facilities? Um, I know there are world-class simulators for pilot trainees to learn with. So let's talk about that. Uh, well, you know, the aviation environment is inherently complex. And as you can imagine, uh, you know, if, if you do something wrong when, you, when you're up in the air, uh, the consequences can be 
quite bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Air Force employs a whole range of simulation mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that you are trained to the highest standard step by step before you even actually get in an airplane or you actually get into a control tower and, and, and control airplanes. You know, and that ranges right from the beginning. You know, you you have a laptop uh, which is delivering training to you in very light simulation. Uh, you know, so you can learn step by step uh, very basic procedures, and then you might step up to, um, you know, both in the air traffic and the, the pilot world, we have part task trainers um, where you know you can just go in and learn very specific skills and procedures. Um, uh, in air traffic control, we'll then step you up to a, a 360 degree simulator where you can practice all of, all of your skills. The, the, the pilots have the flight training device, which is you know, quite a large, uh, impressive bit of kit there, where it's basically the, exactly the same as flying the aircraft. Um, so that by the time you actually hit you know, inside the cockpit or in a control tower for the first time, everything's just normal to you. Um, yeah, so there's quite a range of simulators and you know, what I like to tell people as well, there are opportunities if, if you like teaching people and you, you, that, that's something that you find you, you're very good at, there are opportunities to get involved in simulation, development of simulators and teaching on simulators as well. Now Niall has asked, and I think this is a question for Alana, uh, how did you find Mission Elementary uh, training and do you have any tips for people who want to do well? So the Mission Elementary course was difficult and there's 20 people on a course so it's very competitive but I think people that do well definitely work well as a team together so if the whole course there's a lot of cohesion there then that course is going to perform better. So on Mission Elementary course you start off th the first five, six weeks uh, ground school so I had no av aviation knowledge whatsoever, no background and you learn right from the beginning, you learn everything from scratch to do with aviation and everything that comes with that. Um, and throughout that you have exams, so that's quite intensive. But if you work hard, study and work well with, with each other and study together, that's a great way to do well. From then you go on to a air battle manager phase on course. And through that teamwork is, is huge because you need to practice with one another. And that's obviously, that's a lot uh, more, it's a lot more f uh, physical and like get in there and do the training. And if you are working with other people, that makes that a lot easier than just doing it on your own. Uh, so yeah, just determination and lots of study, but you don't need to have a whole background in aviation because I'm sitting here now and I, I started with nothing. So That's the point, right? They teach you everything. Exactly. <laughs> now, Sohai has asked, how different is it being an officer compared to uh, going through as general entry? So I guess we can talk to the recruiting process and the difference there between coming through as a GE or a general entry role versus the officer roles. So for the officer role, um, you do the same entry requirements as a general entry would. However, you have to also complete an officer selection board in which they assess your suitability to be an officer in terms of leadership and just your general mm. how, how you are. Mm. Um, the difference there also being be to become an officer in aviation, you have to attend the aviation screening process, program sorry, here at Rafe Base ESA where they'll also assess your ability and your cognitive ability to take, undertake those roles. I guess I'll add there as well, you know, it, it's really... Uh, advantageous to you uh, to have on, on your Defence Force recruiting dossier or the information you provide um, any uh, opportunities or examples of leadership that you've had in the past that could just that could just be sports captain uh, mm -hmm. uh, at school uh, you know leadership roles that you've had at work even you know, ma management crew management uh, type positions um, anything along that vein is going to just give you that little push along during the selection when it comes to looking at you as an officer versus general entry. And I suppose talking about leadership, uh, is it crucial that you have leadership experience prior to coming through? Yeah, that's what OTS, uh, Officer Training School, is here for. So even if you haven't had a whole lot of experience, but you have those qualities, then Officer Training School will be able to help you bring those qualities out and train you well as a leader. And then throughout your career, you'll get many, experience, uh, many chances and opportunities to grow as a leader. Yeah, I should, I should add, you know, I say it helps. Yeah, of course. Having leadership experience helps through the recruiting process, but it's not essential. So don't let that scare you away. Just because you're not school captain doesn't mean that you can't get through the process. You should apply and do, do your best. And because, you know, sometimes you might find, we might find that during the interview process, you have leadership qualities that we identify that you just haven't had the, the opportunity to, to use before. Michael asked, what subjects do you recommend doing at school? 
Personally, I did maths, English, and then a lot of science subjects. So I did biology, chemistry, um, and then outside of school, once I'd finished and was in my reserves, I went and did a uh, bridging course for physics. I didn't do it throughout school, and I thought that would be helpful in an aviation career. So just any kind of uh, science subjects are helpful, but also you just need to finish year 12. So being, being able to finish year 12 is all you need to get to this point. Much the same as Lana, I did an English, uh, two math subjects and a physics, and then I didn't complete any university degree prior to joining the military, so the year 12 is really all you need if that's all you wanted to do, mm. put your application forward and they'll assess from there. Yeah, my, my answer is similar to the one about leadership, but it, it helps, you know, if you, if you, if you uh, attempt, you know, the advanced mathematics courses in year 11, 12, depending on the, on the state, uh, what the name is, but, you know, uh, physics and chemistry or biology, you know, look, this is going to help you a little bit, but again, not essential uh, at all. Uh, again, just, you know, come in, do the testing, that's be the major component on our progression decision. And education requirements will differ slightly depending on what job role you're doing. Um, generally, we look at completing Year 12 um, for an officer entry role, but each job role on the Defence Jobs website will list uh, specific education requirements. So if you jump on the website, have a look through the individual job pages, you'll be able to see which education you need for those jobs. Michael asked, did you prepare for the ASP? And if so, how? Uh, personally, I just went there and tried to do the best that I could. So I think that if you have a good positive attitude towards the testing and go just try and have fun with it and do the best that you can, I think you're setting yourself up for success. I think that's, that's what worked for me. If I'd gone into it being nervous and anxious, then I wouldn't have performed as well. So that, that's, how, that's how I went into it. Yeah, I, I, I think I've, I've talked about this before. There's nothing... Yeah, really, there's not a lot that you can do to prepare, or at least we don't have a lot of evidence to say that there is. Mm. Um, you know, again, just come down and try the testing for the first time. You know, we've, we've, we, we have some data on some people who've come back for a second time mm -hmm. and they've been able to improve by, um, by, by working on their weaknesses, mm. but you won't know that until you come down for the first time. And I suppose the point of these testing as well is to test your natural aptitude as well. So in terms of studying and preparing, it's really about what you've already got and what you can give to the job roles. So just come and do the test. Yeah, def definitely. That's my advice every time. <laughs> so Lachlan asked, what sort of skills and personal attributes are you looking for and assessing during the ASP? Uh, well, really what uh, we're looking at is a number of different psychometric domains. You know, So what that means is, I guess the best... Uh, the best way to explain it is that, you know, what we classically view when we think of someone who's a pilot would be, you know, someone who's pretty good at maths, someone who has pretty good hand-eye coordination and has maybe good spatial awareness, you know, where they are in space versus other things, you know, this is the classical stuff that, that, that we test for. Um, However, when you come down to do this testing, which was developed through you know, a number of years and, and a lot of data that was collected by the, the Royal Air Force um, and to a certain extent the Canadian Air Force as well, um, there are actually other psychometric domains that we've found are really, really important. Um, some of those are you know, we, uh, multitasking you know, uh, is one. Um, you know, the way that your brain processes information, things like short-term memory. So there's a wide range uh, of psychometric da uh, domains that we assess, um, as well as adding them all together, you need to have a, a certain total, a total uh, mm. score. And so uh, again, you know, the advice is like, come down and do the testing, come down and do it for the first time. And what we'll do is we'll show you all that information, show you where you already sit, and then you can make a determination on whether or not you can improve. Mm. Now, Alana, you talk about how there are other important roles in the Air Force other than just pilot, which Daniel... <laughs> so let's hear a little bit more about what other job roles there are on offer. I think a lot of people believe that pilot is the be-all and end-all of the Air Force. However, there are many different roles that are available to you. Uh, for example, I've started here at, Mission, at Air Mission Training School on Mission Elementary course, and through this course, I had many options uh, for me at the end of the course uh, and I'll be going as a maritime patrol and response officer on the P-8 Poseidon aircraft in Adelaide. As mission aircrew another option open was the weapon system officer on the Super Hornet or the electronics warfare officer on the Growler so that just shows how many options there are coming through this school. 
So on your initial mission elementary course, you put your preferences in, so you go through and do the course, I think there's courses of 20 people now, so uh, amongst those 20 people you put in your preferences and at the end of the course you get streamed, so uh, it's a matter of how you perform and also what's best for what's best for you, what's best for the Air Force and the number of positions that there are available. Mission Air Crew at the moment at Air Mission Training School, a typical day for me is I get up at 6.30, 7 o'clock, go to the gym, we have four gym sessions a week that are available to us, morning or afternoon, and then generally I have three sim events, simulator events per week. Uh, at the beginning of the course it's a lot of lectures and learning all of the basics and tutorials and then it gets more involved with sims, uh, usually three per week, and then on days when you don't have a sim you're just preparing for the next one or debriefing from that sim and getting goals for the next one and ha ways to improve. I think anyone that's a very determined person is great for a mission air crew role. If you love a fast paced lifestyle where you might be doing something different every day of your job then you are well suited for mission air crew. So it's really great to hear about the options and areas for specialisation. How hard is it to get your preferred selection here? Do you have any tips for candidates? So as you're going through Mission Elementary course, obviously you want to try and do the best that you can to make yourself competitive. But at, at the end of that 12 weeks, any of the jobs that you can go stream towards are great opportunities. But obviously trying to get the one that you want, you just need to attempt to perform the best you can and, and then progress from there. So go through each of the steps, go from Mission Elementary course to then Mission Air Crew Common course. And then from there stream, if that's what you want, Mission Air Crew onto maritime or weapon systems officer or back at mission elementary course after 12 weeks then you can go to air traffic control as i as i did mention and yeah if you just work hard you will hopefully get the results that you're after but obviously it depends on how many jobs there are and how competitive you are with other people on your course so is it strictly merit based to get your preferred uh so you were looking at the maritime job role mm -hmm. so was that merit-based, uh, you talk about jobs that are available as well. Mm -hmm. Are there any other factors there? Um, I think it, obviously personality type comes into it as well. So going maritime, you have to be able to work well in a team. So they look at your personality throughout and how, how you're working with, with the group. And, and I think yeah, your personality is a big part that plays into it as well. Yeah, cool. Jet asked, will having aviation experience and knowledge when joining help you in the screening process? Had any of you had flying experience prior to joining? I had no experience whatsoever. <laughs> I had no flying experience before I um, applied either. I um, had two um, just flights out of Parafoot Airport in Adelaide just to see whether I liked it or not, and I did, so I applied, and from there, I didn't feel like I needed any extra aviation knowledge to help me, but it may or may not help. It's definitely on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I didn't have any experience either. Um, yeah, it's probably worth, uh, you know, I, I, it just, for the exposure uh, benefits, to you know, go and do an hour joy flight or something somewhere with it with an instructor, um, it, it does a couple of things. Firstly, you might find that you don't like flying um, in, in an aeroplane. You know, you have the passion for it, but then you actually get in there and go, "Oh, this is a bit un uncomfortable for me." Um, but also, it, it will help you. You know, again, it's one of these things that might push you through. Um, if we see that you've actually um, ha had a little bit of flying experience. Yeah. It's not going to help you in the training, but it lets us know, okay, you definitely have a motivation uh, for flying. And then, you know, when you get through to the interview process, you're going to be able to answer questions. Why do you want to be a pilot? Well, actually, I've been flying and, and you can talk about what it feels like for you. Tanya asked, what are the age requirements? Uh, I joined when I was just seven. I started my joining process when I was 17, but I believe you can join, uh, start your application process for ADVA when you turn 16. And then when you are 16 and a half, you can apply for other jobs. Yep, easy. Uh, Yen Ben asked, I am a permanent resident. Can I apply for jobs? So you can apply uh, for the Defence Jobs Australia when you are um, a permanent resident, but you will need your Australian citizenship in order to enlist or appoint. Uh, it's best to have a look at the Defence Jobs website or perhaps give 131902 a call and have a chat to somebody about that one. Now, is there a lot of practical work here at the training school? Definitely, for me, there's a lot of practical work. When mm -hmm. I first got here, we had roughly six weeks of um, classroom-based lectures and activities where we learnt 
basically how an aircraft operates and how to fly an aircraft. Uh, from there, we um, moved towards flying the simulator that um, Sir here talked about before, uh, where we apply those skills that we learnt in the operational uh, in a practical environment, but also in a safe environment at the same time. And from there, we actually moved to flying the aircraft, the real aircraft that's behind us right now, in the real environment. So definitely there's a lot of practical work involved, but you still, there's still a lot of theory behind that as well. Uh, Ashley has asked a very important question. What's the food like here? Uh, the mess <laughs> provides us three meals a day and um, it's very nice. And when um, we're flying at night or we're flying during the day, they'll also bring us sandwiches over and salads over to the classrooms and they make hot meals for us for dinner and they bring them over as well. So they're always there supporting all the flying activities that are going on. It's definitely for us. Yeah, same at uh, Air Mission Training School. They provide rations when we have flights for the day, sandwich packs, and yeah, they're definitely well accommodating. Yeah, nice. So can you live on base here at East Sale? Yeah, so everyone that goes through, or most trainees, live on base at Air Mission Training School, live right across the road from the school, which is very handy, just a 10, 10 metre walk to school. <laughs> um, if you do have family, though, you are allowed to live off base and live with your family, so that's definitely an option too. Definitely encourage that, yeah, when you're on course, you do uh, live on base because you live with who you work with. You, yes, you have your private room and your ensuite, but you share a common room and it's very nice to be able to keep your door open and study with everyone else and you can throw questions across the hall and everyone's there to help each other, but then you can close your door and get your own time when you need it. And then you've got your common room, so everyone hangs out on the weekends, you watch, the, watch any sport or watch any movies together. It's quite a nice environment. And what are the social opportunities like here? Social opportunities are, Everyone gets down to the gym, plays a bit of squash together. Uh, there's the roulette cinema as well, so you can go Tuesday nights and Saturday nights. There's always movies on, so sometimes go there with some course mates and friends. But yeah, living with the people that you work with, you've always got someone, like Daniel said, just across the hallway to talk to if you need to. Anything to add to that? No, no, I guess I, sh I should point out, it's, it's, you know, it's just like socially, you know, yeah. being, being in the Air Force is just like any other job. In fact, most roles in the Air Force, we, we have a Monday to Friday job. In fact, we work extra hours on Monday to Thursday, so we get to have a, a half day on Friday and have a bit of a longer weekend so that we can go and enjoy those extracurricular activities or you know, hang out with friends, uh, do whatever social activities we like to do. There are some jobs where you have shift work or if you're a pilot, you might be flying certain aircraft types on the weekend and all, all kinds of different hours. But again, no different to civilian jobs where you, know, you might end up in shift work or, yeah, exactly. or, or, or abnormal hours. Mm. So when you talk about work hours during the week, I mean, you say you work Monday through Thursday, so you get the early mark on Friday. Does that mean your weekends are your own? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, if you get all your study done during the week and manage your time, try to take some time off on the weekend. So yeah, absolutely, weekends are your own. Yeah, it's definitely very important to have some downtime on the weekends and get your head out of the books <laughs> and just relax. Go for a drive. You can go away for the weekend or you can just still hang out with your friends, but it's definitely good to get away from the books and definitely have some time to yourself. Yeah, great. Now, Daniel, you have just graduated here at the training school. Congratulations. So let's hear a little bit more about your journey from student to pilot and what's next for you. So I've been here at number one flying training school now for six months and I've just graduated. When I first got here, we completed the ground school events and we moved to flying the real aircraft, the PC-21 behind me with an instructor. And at times we flew solo as well. So the typical day in the life of an Air Force pilot for me here at 1FTS, the training school, will come to uh, work in the morning for the morning brief or we'll get briefed on the weather and any training events that we have for that day. Now a training event could include a simulator event, any ground school lessons I have planned or going flying in the aircraft that's behind me. When we start here at 1FTS we start with about six weeks of ground school where we learn about our aircraft and we learn how an aircraft flies. From there we'll step to the simulator where we apply those skills that we've learnt in a safe environment. From the simulator, we'll move to the real aircraft where we'll be able to apply those skills that we've learnt in the real aircraft and the real environment. While doing that, we still continue to fly the simulator and work with further ground school events and further improving our skills. So in the sim, we practice flying through cloud and flying at night and in windy conditions where that is a safe environment so that we can better our skills if we do encounter those in the real aircraft. From there, we moved into some night flying where we, can, where we learn how to fly at night in the dark and land in unusual conditions. So every time we go flying here at ESAL, we work with the air traffic controllers who provide us a service and a safe environment that we can go flying in so we're not to conflict with any other aircraft or traffic that may be in the area. 
the balance between practical and theory work for me is about 50-50. My favourite thing about being a pilot in the Air Force would be on a fly to state of the air, uh, aircraft like the one behind me. From here, I'm moving over to Pierce in Western Australia to continue my training in the advanced phase. So firstly, congratulations again on this achievement so far, Daniel. That's amazing to hear. So when you say you'll now be undertaking the advanced training, uh, can you tell us what this will entail and where, you're, or where you ultimately hope to be in your aviation career? So the advanced training uh, is undertaken at number two flying training school, which is in Rough Base Pierce in Western Australia. And it comes together to bring what we've learned here. So basically how to fly an aircraft. And we put it into a more operational type role. So we learned formation flying, more advanced night flying and low level flying and quite advanced aerobatic sequences. Um, and that's to teach us and um, so we can learn, definitely we'll learn how to fly the aircraft in the operational environment as a military pilot. And from there, I'm hoping to move towards flying fighter jets. And if that is not an option for myself, um, I'd love to fly the P-8 Poseidon as well. Fantastic. Now, what uh, Bez has asked, what are the daily leadership roles of an officer? Well, it, it, it depends. It, so it, might not know yet, it really, <laughs> yeah, it, it really does uh, depend. I mean, you know, if, if you want to be a pilot, all right, you, you are going to be the pilot in command of an airplane, all right, you know, and that, that comes with, with its certain leadership responsibilities. Um, you know, if you're going to be a maritime patrol response officer uh, like Alana, then, um, you know, you are going to be the, le the leader of the crew that is on that airplane, in fact, including the pilot. You, you're the mission commander uh, for, for the airplane. Um, you know, as an air traffic controller, you know, as a tower controller, you're responsible for all the aircraft taking off uh, and landing. So yeah, that, that in, is inherently a leadership role in itself. But as you progress through your career, um, the reason we're looking for people, you know, who have that, that the leadership aptitude is because you are going to progressively start to, you know, be in command of people and manage people. Um, you know, you usually start off by, um, you know, getting promoted and you might be in charge of one or two people, maybe as an instructor, you have some trainees or you're a mentor. Um, then you may be uh, in charge of a section of people and so you need to report on the people in that section and as you promote higher, you'll progressively be in charge of more people uh, and more assets. You know, the CEO of a squadron is get you, you are going to be responsible not just for the, for, for the pilots, but for the maintenance um, and uh, for actually managing the, the asset or the aircraft itself. And what are the fitness requirements like here? How do you maintain your fitness? Uh, so for myself at Air Mission Training School, uh, once we're streamed mission air crew, we have four gym sessions available to us uh, with the PTIs, the personal training instructors. Uh, and that's morning or afternoon, whenever fits into our schedule. So that's a great way to keep fit. And then we just have to pass our personal fitness test once a year which involves a 2.6k run, uh, push-ups and sit-ups or the arm hang instead of the push-ups if you're not uh, up for push-ups. Uh, but yeah, you just have to do that test once a year and, and then you maintain your own fitness. And um, it's a huge benefit, I suppose, of joining the ADF that you are indeed paid to keep fit. Absolutely. Better than us suckers who are paying $80 a week for the gym, huh? The gym here at Sales <laughs> is pretty great, yeah. So let's talk about the gym, I guess, and other facilities here at the, at the uh, RAF base. What are they like? So like I said, we have the gym. In the same facility, we also have a heated indoor lap pool, mm -hmm. an indoor basketball court, and a, I believe an indoor squash court as well. We also have um, an outdoor running track that's quite nice, nice 400 metre Olympic sized track. Um, we also have outdoor tennis courts as well. So there's quite a broad range of different um, things that we have set up for us to maintain our fitness, as well as um, all the other things we have in base. We have the mess that we can you know, see all our friends on the weekend and we can come out and there's, there's a TV room in there, there's a pool table, table tennis tables. So there's all different options to go out and just hang out. And then like we spoke about before, the roulette cinema. So you can go and see a movie on the weekend. It's, it's relatively cheap and yeah, it's quite nice. Yeah, that's really great. What are the other benefits of the Defence Force? Let's talk about that. The good stuff, huh? Uh, one of my main ones definitely is just the friends that I've made throughout gap year reserves and now here. So throughout gap year, I now have friends that are all over the country. So I can go to any state and essentially have someone to stay with, which is it's awesome. Convenient. <laughs> yeah. I don't know many other jobs that you can, you can say no. give you that opportunity. So. Um, even for the very short period of time that I've been in the Defence Force, I've had a lot of travel with yeah. the military. So I've been lucky enough to travel up to Malaysia and I've been lucky enough to travel to almost every state 
in Australia as well while I've been here. Mm. So the travel benefits are really, really good. Yeah, well, in, in, and in addition to the pay, uh, you know, being paid to train, mm. um, I think uh, a lot of uh, what is often overlooked is actually the benefits that you get being in the Defence Force in the long term. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, it, it, in addition to the pay, you get rent assistance so that you can go and, and rent a nice place somewhere. Uh, you, you, know, you can opt to purchase a place and Defence will actually, you know, you, you're entitled to subsidies to help you pay off uh, your loan. Um, you know, free medical and dental and all those things. Even your family has access to a limited amount of um, uh, subsidised medical as well. Uh, you know, and you know, now that I'm talking about family, you know, there are all kinds of generous parental leave benefits for, for both females and, and, and males when, when, they, when they have children. Um, you know, the, the superannuation is very, very generous compared to, um, to, to, to other civilian, civilian jobs. Um, you know, and yeah, I've, I've just, I'm kind of just listing a few. A few. There are all kinds of hidden benefits that you get um, from joining to Defence that you wouldn't get in other jobs. Um, another benefit, I suppose. Are there opportunities for further studies while you're serving? Uh, yeah, definitely. So later on, you can you can study masters and things like that if that's what you'd like to pursue in your career. Uh, I'm not not 100% an expert on this, but I'm. Teddy might. Yeah, I mean, if you again, if it's related to your work, yeah. um, defence will will flat out pay pay for you and pay for the books and all, and give you free time or give you time off work to go and pursue a, a degree. Um, and that could be, maybe you didn't go to ADFA, um, you, you've gone direct entry uh, and you don't have a degree yet that you want, well, they'll, they'll sponsor you uh, to complete a degree, you know, if it's related, related to work in some way. Um, as you get promoted through the ranks, you, you know, there are opportunities um, to do command and staff course where you actually come out with the masters. Um, you know, the, the majority do, do it in Canberra in Australia, but there are opportunities to actually go overseas and complete your masters. So you're getting paid to go overseas and study uh, to get a master's degree, all right, there are lots of education, further education opportunities. Yeah. Noah has asked, what are the desk jobs or I guess the theory tasks that a pilot may have to do in between flights? Uh, so in between a flight, so when we first get to the day, we have what's called morning brief. So that's, uh, so we sit down uh, in the classroom and we get spoken to by uh, a MET person who will brief us on the weather for that day. And then we'll get um, told what our events are for that day. And from that point, um, when we know what events we have, we go up to the classroom and we actually prepare for that event. So we'll study what we have to do that flight, um, what we need to work on from our last flight, and any new things that we might be being, being taught that flight. We also need to look into all the other um, things that might be happening in the area, the airspace, around the runways that we need to monitor while we're flying to make sure that we stay safe. And then once you get back from flying, you actually have to go and debrief with your instructor and they'll walk you through what you did well, what you didn't do so well, what they want to see improvement on. And then you actually go back to the classroom and you just sit down and you, for personally, I sit through and I run through my head what, what I did and how I could improve it for next time and tend to write little notes to myself on different things that I've forgotten that I need to try and remember. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of, um, yeah, sitting down at your desk and just planning for that next flight or looking back on older flights and seeing what you need to improve and what you could improve. I mean, it's definitely important once you get in one of these things and go for a flight, you'd want to be prepared. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and indeed, flying one of these is a huge benefit and working with these aircraft is such a benefit of being in the Air Force uh, and the Defence Force. What would you say is the best part or your most favourite thing about being in the Air Force in the aviation sector? For me, is being able to work with state-of-the-art aircraft like this one behind me and knowing that um, upon graduation that you'll be moving towards even more advanced aircraft than the one that's behind us that you might not be able to get for a long time when you're working in a civilian job. So it's definitely a huge benefit to working in the military and the aviation sector, just how amazing these aircraft really are. Uh, myself, it just seems surreal to even be in an aircraft and flying. So. Probably one of the greatest things I've done so far on course is uh, I got to fly an approach into Mount Hotham as a, a co-pilot for my mission training. And that was pretty great to see all the snow out the window. So just taking a moment to look out the window and, and think about how cool it is to do what I'm doing now. So. Yeah, for, for me, the highlight, oh, I mean, there are lots of highlights, but I mean, main, mainly maybe working, work, the people that you work with are generally interested in the same thing that you are, you know, and um, you know, you're all working as a team to, to achieve the same mission. 
um, you know, and working together and achieving that, you know, is, is really satisfying. Um, you know, but I guess, you know, I, I like to say it's, it's the, that comes from the opportunities, the opportunities that you get given, right? If you, if you come down and do the aviation screening program, uh, you know, 90% of you want to be pilots, but I'm going to, well, we are potentially going to offer you other opportunities. And if you take them, amazing things can happen. I took the opportunity to be an air traffic controller, you know, and I, you know, I ended up in Haiti in 2010 after the earthquake, um, which was very, very eye-opening, but also an amazing uh, experience. Um, you know, I, I've already mentioned I had the opportunity to go and live in San Diego for three years and, and hang out with the, the US Marine Corps. Um, you know, w weird, strange things can happen. I've talked about already about um, you know, managing the simulator. Uh, you know, w when MH370 went missing, most people r remember the aircraft that just disappeared uh, out of nowhere. I, I was one of a few people qualified to do search and rescue, so I ended up you know, in Canberra doing liaison between government um, and, and the team in Perth. You know, so just amazing opportunities that almost don't have anything to do with your job role, but you just take them and go with it. Absolutely. Look, that is all that we have time for today. Thank you so much for your questions, everyone, and thank you for answering them today. I feel like we're just on time, right, as we're winding down. There are some aircraft winding up outside, ready to go. Uh, remember, you can jump onto the Defence Jobs website to apply and find out more information. Uh, and any other questions that we haven't had the opportunity to answer, we will get to in the next few days. So thank you, and we'll see you next time.